Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Off The Fence, brought to you in association with Ball Sports, of course. We record this on a Monday evening and it comes to you on a Tuesday evening. And you know the drill by now because most of you will be loyal viewers and listeners out there. We'll be looking back at the action from the weekend just gone. And also on this episode, a few other tidbits for you. We are going to be going on a bit of a deeper dive into the Gold Cup and the anti-post market for the feature race, of course, at the Cheltenham Festival and we've also got price boost for you coming up we've got a competition winner we've got another free bet to give away and we will be doing a brief look ahead to the coming weekend as well so plenty to get stuck into in the next half an hour or so and of course I get to do this in the company week in week out of Tony Keenan and Barry Geraghty Barry we will come to you first because you're not very well so we will <laughs> forgive you for being a little bit under the weather this show not your usual sparkling self no, no, um, a bit of a touch of man flu, I think, maybe, but uh, getting through it, Vanessa, somehow. Somehow, you're struggling on. I'm sure the viewers out there will have so much sympathy for you. Uh, Tony, how are you and how was your week off? Week off was grand, yeah. I'm sure Barry will come right to be chanting him. Um, <laughs> he, he has three, three weeks to straighten himself out at this stage. I'm sure he'll be well fixed up. I'm sure, yeah, he'll be right back on track. Short price favourite, Barry Garrity for Cheltenham. Um, right, lads, we are going to go straight into our What Happened Where section, as we tend to do, obviously. And we will kick straight off with the Ascot Chase, the big feature race on Saturday. And, of course, it saw Pick Dory uh, romp to victory in said Ascot Chase from Ahoy Senor and La Honne Press. And all eyes were probably on the latter horse as much as anything in regards to that crucial gold cup market we'll cover him shortly but barry i will start with you because of course harry cobden in the saddle aboard pick dory and i mean the ride got all the focus afterwards really away from the horse but rightly so to be honest with you i thought it was uh exceptional from harry cobden yeah it was a great ride um i suppose the horse was the most natural horse at this trip um, and his jumping was really well suited to Ascot, away from the stands in Ascot. You know, if you have a horse who goes forward and attacks his fences like this fella did, you can make lengths. And he did that, and he got his rivals under pressure. So Harry gave him a really good ride. He maximised his horse's ability uh, in the process. But I think it was a little bit unfair to judge the other riders so negatively on it. Um, I don't think Harry dictated the pace. Harry just went a good gallop, and his horse was able to go that pace. Um, for me, Laham Press, he looked more laboured at this... Um, you know, going right-handed, he was jutting a bit left, he was losing a bit of ground, losing a bit of momentum. But at Kempton last Christmas, or last Christmas, 12 months of the King George, for me, he travelled better. I just felt that this run was coming quick enough after his, his first run back after 13 months in Linkfield last time. And I'm not just fully sure that we saw him at his best. I don't think he would have touched the, the winner over this trip going right-handed. Um, but I don't think that Charlie Deitch did as much around as was made out. And likewise, uh, Derek Fox was always going to drop in a high senior a little bit, get him relaxed and get him jumping. That was his main main goal, if you like, before winning the race. Um, and it was, that wasn't going to happen if he booked him out smart on Harry Cobden's tail. So I think Harry Cobden maximised his horse's ability, um, but I don't think the other jockeys did as much wrong as maybe we were led to believe. OK, Barry in quite the forgiving mood then. And yeah, it's definitely sort of split opinion um, in regards to those jockeys in behind uh, the winner, Pick Dory. Um, Tony, I suppose we can segue nicely into the Gold Cup discussion. If you want to pick up with the uh, maybe sort of discussion around Lahon Press, do you agree with Barry that maybe the quick turnaround, going the wrong way, etc. I mean, he's the first of our price boost for what it's worth. Lahon Press has been boosted by Ball Sports to 16 to 1 for the Gold Cup from 12s, a general 12 to 1 shot. Um, but now 16s with Ball Sports must just point out that is for a limited time only and those prices can change. So get involved quickly if you would like to get involved with the price boost. But Tony, back to the discussion. Uh, was Lahon Press kind of your main focus point coming out of this? Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, I would agree with Barry. I don't think picking at the jockey now um, would seem a little bit harsh to me. Maybe the jockey in the tour which should have had his horse a little bit handier, but I don't think um, the home press could go any faster than he was going. Um, he was well under the pump at this trip. Um, I, I do think maybe the second run is actually no harm for him because he has been off for so long and as a younger horse novice chaser and that he actually thrived on racing. So 
maybe this race, I'd say almost certainly this race wasn't the be all and end all, just to get a little bit of more match practice into him before Cheltenham. And it was never really going to be a, an ultra suitable race with the configuration of the track and the trip. Um, so yeah, he's drifted out whatever, what was he, 8 to 1 kind of general for the Gold Cup beforehand, he's now kind of 12, 14 to 1, he, he doesn't strike me as a terrible, terrible price for the Gold Cup, um, although possibly he would be a little bit, um, not to say totally dependent on getting a bit of slow ground, but I think it would certainly be a help. Um, the time he won the Broadway, obviously it, it poured heavily on the morning of the race, that was not the day that the, the near, they were, they took uh, what, 10 or 15 minutes looking at the bumper course where they're going to decide to go ahead, so... Um, little bit of slow ground uh, would be kind of a help to him. No, I, I definitely wouldn't be ruling him out of the Gold Cup totally on the back of this. Uh, I think it was more a sharp and up run than necessarily a, a be-all and end-all with um, Friday three weeks in mind. Well, that's very interesting indeed. And of course, if you do fancy him, as I've already pointed out, Lahan Press is the first of our prize boost, but for a limited time only. But Barry, then we might as well talk about the Gold Cup as a bigger picture then, because we do kind of have the majority, well, no, all, I think we have all the jigsaw pieces in place now for the Gold Cup picture. So with ball sports, your betting goes like this. It's Gallop into Champs, four to five to off the market, of course. Uh, fast or slow, four to one. Shishkin, sevens. Jerry Kalam, eight. Eight to one, Lahan press on that price boost of 16s currently, but more of a general four, uh, 12 to one shot. And um, Brave Man's game 14s, Hewick 14s, and it's 16s bar that. So, Barry, where is your head at right now with the Gold Cup? Uh, obviously, we have a short price favourite at the top of the market. Do you see any flaws in him and any value elsewhere? It's hard to find a fly in him. He was brilliant last year and, you know, he had to overcome a little bit through the race because he, he lost his position. He had to work back into a position. Um, he has been good this year with the exception of his defeat in the John Durkham, but at Christmas he, he was brilliant um, and the Dublin Racing Festival as well. So it, it is hard to see on the book what will beat him. Fast or slow, I think, uh, will be better with a truer run race. I think that will play to his strength. So it was definitely fast and slow will be more competitive, but will he have the edge to beat him? Not on the book for me anyway. Um, Shishkin has run the King George definitely, but for me, Newbury looked a far more laboured performance. So I think, um, you know, what, what Shishkin turns up on the day, um, really it'll be what we need to judge there. So it's hard to say. The one for me who could be value is last year's runner, Brave Man's Game. Uh, Paul Nichols in his stable tour recently, how he mentioned how he didn't, cover himself in glory and how he's trained this fella this autumn so um, you know he mentioned that he ran him in heavy ground in Weatherby on his first run he ran him back three weeks there on soft ground in the Betfair and then he ran him in the King George there were three tough races to come on the bounce um, he went straight from Weatherby to the King George last year where he beat Royal Pagai 14 lengths Royal Pagai beats him in the Betfair chase and Royal Pagai fell when competitive in the in the, the old pillar chase if you like in Cheltenham back in January so he's he, he's ran to the same level of form as he would have shown through last season and this season um, so I think Brave Man's game is a horse who will bounce back massively trained for the day he said he has him very fresh um, so to me he would be the value against the favourite Intriguing. That is very interesting and specifically throwing to you then, Tony, because it you have highlighted the well in the early part of the season on this show, Tony, you highlighted Brave Man's game slightly sort of not odd campaigning because we want to see these horses run. So I don't want to start throwing stones at that. But um, it was a little bit there was some unlike Paul Nichols decisions made in the early part of the season, I think it's fair to say in regards to that horse. Yeah, it's 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 funny. I think I think it was Barry who was more questioning the campaign and stuff like that. Not oh, questioning, sorry. saying that maybe he's running back a little bit quick. Um, I suppose sometimes when these horses get beaten first time up, when maybe they're expected to win, the, the trainer kind of I don't know wants to set the record right right a little bit. Gallop and the Shumps maybe could be put into that category too. But running them back at Christmas if it wasn't the initial plan. A brave man's game has had the the bit of a break now. Paul Nichols would be typically very good at bringing them back to form. Haven't had that bit of time off it is just the stamina would still be just a little bit of a concern at the, the very last um, you know four long four long and a half or so does he just stay it quite as well as some of these others I'm not just sure um, that he does I think Barry's covered there a lot about Gallop in the shop if he does turn up in the form of last season or in the form of Christmas uh, it's hard to see him beating just granted um, normal luck but it is hard to retain a gold cup 
and he has gone to all the three um, available grade one kind of middle distance stay and chases type of thing in Ireland um, through the winter and into the kind of spring. I, I, th I think at the DRF he's probably fortunate in the way that he hasn't had a hard race there because they've gone such a kind of a steady pace though I think fast or slow to me was ridden a little bit with the next day in mind um, I thought you know he was kind of making up ground at, at his fences but JJ Slavin was keen enough that he didn't want to get into a battle with Gallup and the Shams and kind of after the second last so I do think there should be a little bit of improvement in him um, for that run and just looking at the trainer's kind of past record that he would be more of a person to be aiming at the, the very biggest of days rather than not to say that the RF wasn't a big day but the Gold Cup is um, of more kind of importance. Kind of off the rest of them, Shishkin, I'd just be worried that he, he, he'll he make a mistake or kind of get, get behind at, at points there and um, just make fine things happen a little bit too quick from probably maybe the Gold Cup was a race for him a year or two ago which it's just hard for that to see that older type of horse winning it. Jerry Kalam, like Gordon Elliott opted not to bother to go to the DRF and prepare him at home for this kind of race. I, I would have thought all along last season that he was hard to thrive in racing again, a bit like Lom Press. So I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Um, it's worth a go, but he, he does kind of have to prove it. And I'm not sure there were any massive excuses um, for uh, the Christmas run in that. Gentleman's Game is in there as well. He's another one that's going there fresh. Uh, he's beaten Braveman's Game, which is kind of very hard to know. What kind of form Brave Man's game was in on that occasion, um, and what else have you got there? Well, you've Hewick. I suppose with Hewick, it is going. It is going to kind of come down to the ground. I, I think he would need a quite decent on top um, to have a chance. But he does have a very good kind of record on goodish ground. I think at the moment, if, if you're thinking of having a bet, it, it's an okay race for a bet. I was just looking at the percentages there. I think the top ten runners in the Gold Cup, and there's not going to be uh, maybe an awful lot more than them. We're kind of adding up to about 120 percent. So you're you're not being ripped off having a bet at the moment. Um, you might do a little bit better between now and then, and obviously there will be moves on the day, and that's so again, it's, it's it's not terrible for a bet at the moment. But the one, the one I kind of liked, um, I have actually backed this horse, uh, small kind of each way, and there is are somewhat out the favourite markets, um, is Korak Rambler. Um, now he's kind of a, a little a little bit out of sight, out of mind at the moment, but he does have a, a few, I think, strong kind of positives um, in his kind of armoury here. I think his course form obviously is excellent. Uh, his festival form obviously too is strong. Um, I like the fact that he ties in with faster slow from last season. Faster slow's really gone on from that, and you know that gives the form a little bit of solidity that he was able to go on and win a, a Grade One level. I thought he was really impressive in the in, in the Grand National last season, and just the way he travelled through it. Um, I know Vanilla closed him down a bit late, but like. Cork Rambler was kind of always the best horse and he's just had a couple of runs there back in the autumn that are kind of completely unsuitable, kind of trip too sharp and a you know, small field in the bet fair to track that probably isn't really for him so is he a really likely winner? I'm not sure but I think he's quite likely to be in the first three, four or five here um, and horses of his kind of ilk do have a tendency to get into the kind of shake up there and I was happy enough I think he's kind of general 20 to 1 there was some double figures there without the favourite points there both of those to me strike me as quite decent um, each way bets he, he would want a pace to run at um, and the kind of the front runners I suppose as galloping the champs seems like he's going to be quite forward the way he's been ridden at the moment the real whackers another one that will probably be up there but there's plenty in there that don't like to be too far away either um, Braveman's game High Senor, maybe if he were to run, Jerry Colom wouldn't be held up by any means. Hewick too has on occasion, so I do think it'll be a reasonably run race. I think he's certainly got a chance of getting into the first three or four, and if maybe something was wrong for one or two of the others, he might even have a winning chance. Yeah, that's fascinating angle because you can just so see him with that funny white head of his, just sort of canter galloping into a place up the hill with a fast finish. Um, yeah, I, can, I like that angle a lot. And that leads us on to our free bet competition. Who do you fancy for the Gold Cup? Just get involved in the comments box below. We're giving away these free bets week in, week out at the moment, courtesy of Ball Sports, of course. It's a £20 or Euro free bet. And all you have to do is comment below where I'm pointing right now in the YouTube comment section. And we, at random, pick a winner, essentially. And I'm going to be revealing the winner of last week's free bet very shortly indeed. But for now, we will plough on with our What Happened Where section. Um, Barry, let's go back to to Ascot, please. The Swindley Handicap Chase saw uh, three under through five put his uh, sort of credentials slightly on the line, maybe, as a national horse. Do you see him as a national horse, Barry? 
I suppose he was a horse who probably failed to live to expectations the last couple of seasons. But he's found his form this year. He was second in the Badger Rail. He was second at Cheltenham in December. And then this is a good performance to win an Ascot with top weight. Um, he has crept up to weights to 150 now. So, you know, he is a horse who would have a chance. Um, I can't say he's the most natural jumper in the world, but maybe the course isn't as big a test as it once was. So it was hard to take any fault from his performance in Ascot at the weekend. He was a good, solid winner. Um, and he was he was on the farm. He was the one to beat uh, with his run in Cheltenham with protector at back and third. So he's definitely honest, he would have a chance, but it's hard to say he's ahead of the handicapper at this stage. Yeah, fair comments. I think, and for what it's worth, he has been price boosted by Boyle Sports to forty to one. So he's a pretty big price anyway already, at about twenty five to one mark. But he's been boosted out to forty to one for the Grand National. So if you're a fan of the horse, if you're if you fancy him and you think he is a national horse, despite the fact I maybe don't, um, then do get involved with the price boost. But of course, it's for a limited time only, and it may well change. Um, Barry, if we're talking about national horses and sort of staying handicaps, and we're in that category, then we better make sure that we mention the national trial up at Haydock, which saw Yeah Man uh, win for uh, Sean Flanagan, of course, in the saddle for Gavin Cromwell. Um, a terrific race, actually, beating the mare in the finish and sort of going hammer and tongs. It was an excellent race, real staying performance in that ground, but it was it was a good spectacle rather than a bad one, which some. Sometimes those heavy ground staying races can can go a bit the negative way. Yeah, it was a good performance. Yeah, built in his form was second in Ascot previously. Um, but I thought the race Sean Flanagan gave this horse was brilliant. Uh, he dropped in early, he crept into it halfway, he got into, into mid-division and he just crept it on quietly. Um, James Best pressed on early on the straight and my silver lining as he did in Warwick and really made it a test. But Sean, on his first straight around Haydock, he didn't get sucked into it. He sat, he waited, he crept. They st- started to deliver his challenge after the second last and was a good strong winner at the line. Um, I just thought it was a really well judged ride. He kept his head cool. He didn't get sucked into the early pace. There's only one winning post, as the saying Sean knew where it was. So no, I thought it was really well judged and a good ride for a fellow having his first ride around the track. Barry, who was the best ride of the weekend? Harry Cobden on Pick Dory or Sean Flanagan on the Man? Uh... Well, uh, Harry Cobden's ride was probably he was always the most likely winner you could say after four fences so he just did what he was doing um, Sean Flanagan had to you know not get sucked into the scrap you had a previous winner um, of the Warwick Chase pressing on early in the straight and he was happy to sit and wait for me it's always the, the biggest decisions are when you have a decision you know, the best rides, if you have a decision, do I sit or do I go? And if you sit and win, that's a great, you know, it's to make those right decisions. So for me, Sean had more decisions to make through the race than Harry Cobden. Harry's was a brilliant ride, good positive forward ride, but it probably didn't challenge him as much as Sean's ride. So a yeah, toss of a kind, but not much in it, but maybe Sean short heads it. I've learned that that's a great lesson for me going forward, that the good rides are when a decision has to be made, because I think you can fall into a trap sometimes calling something a good ride but actually maybe in hindsight they didn't even have a decision to make they were just sort of the horse made that decision anyway uh we roll on tony because of course gavin cromwell had an excellent day at uh at, at haydock yeah man and also he had uh now is the hour winning the grade two as well up there so another successful raid for team cromwell over here in the uk and it's become a real theme of this season hasn't it yeah, absolutely. Um, I know he's on record as saying he, he has come over to um, Britain to maybe avoid Gordon Elliott and especially Willie Mullins, but I would think the prize money is, is at least as big a concern. Um, just taking his runners and winners kind of since the start of October, which would be um, start of National Hunt season proper, I suppose. He's a 35 winners in Ireland and 11 in Britain. But the, to me, the most shocking statistic is of the top 10 most valuable races he's won, um, the top eight were all in Britain um, and kind of on Saturday he won the most valuable race on the card and um, the third most valuable race on the card. Now none of the horses you would think are maybe a grade one horse in Ireland, even grade two horses in Ireland, but certainly they have been um, extremely well placed I would say to, to, to maximise their prize money and just again the idea that Ireland always has superior prize money to, to Britain I think is shown to be on through with the way he has um, campaigned the likes of Bray Hill and Stumptown and, and those two that, that won on, on Saturday. 
Intriguing, intriguing. I wonder, yeah, is this a theme we're going to see? There's no reason that it won't continue this theme, obviously, into next season and beyond. It's been so successful for him so far. Should just point out that Yemen is much more likely to go for the ball sport, Irish Grand National, uh, or that has been mentioned as his main target or his potential target. Um, And another horse that may well be heading to the Irish Grand National is where it all began, Tony, who won the Punchestown National Trial at the weekend for Team Gordon, Elliot and Co. Uh, Does he need the heavy ground? Is that absolutely essential for this horse? I'd say he needs a slog anyway. He he, he looked, um, you know, over three miles that he was kind of handicapped to the hilt, but when he got it, stepped up and trip, he found a chunk of improvement, really pulled away from what would look a very well handicapped horse. So Willie Mullins in second, the um, wheel have won. So I think Gordon Elliott was winning that race for the, the, the fifth time in seven years. Does really well with these kind of novices, less exposed horses going into the stay in handicapped chases. The winner would have also played a good compliment to um, a horse called Intense Raffles, who beat him at... Fairy House, kind of unusual horse. Uh, well done to the trainer Tom Gibney for getting um, kind of the the Munir and, and Suede horses into the yard, and he certainly made a good start with that horse. You think there probably a race or two in him. I thought of the rest, um, kind of it seemed to be you know right place seemed to be on the pace. Um, Punches Town, kind of they were on the inner chase track there, and it can be quite tight. Clan Main ran all right to kind of come home to take third. He was the best of those held up. I thought on buying, um, I was kind of castigating Jack Kennedy for his ride on him in, in the Tiest as well. Uh, I'd say some of it is between the horse's ears now as well because he, he just moved into it there, coming to the last look and like, oh, look, well, he's definitely going to be placed, but he just basically pulled himself up. So, um, yeah, Dunbine now would be one for the um, for the, the list you maybe don't want to be to be back in unless it's a Tiest is. And I also thought there was an interesting run um, from any second now. I thought he showed a pulse now for the first time in a while, which wouldn't be unusual because he is more of a spring horse. Um, kind of w- w- was going OK, uh, kind of out on the outside, um, coming to three out and, you know, it wasn't getting the hardest time and got, maybe got a little bit out of pace and then kind of kept on quite well in the straight. Um, he's... I know he's 12 now and you'd be thinking he's kind of over the hill but he did win a grade 2 at Navin around this time last year I'd say there's a little bit of fire in the belly yet and judging him on his kind of early season runs here I'm not sure that's the right thing to do because he is to say a horse that likes a bit of nice ground now the crack is going to be like the standoff I suppose with the handicapper on what his mark's going to be if um, he's running over in the Grand National like he was off one four four here on on Sunday and it was the kind of run that he's going to see him dropped a couple of three pounds um as well I would have thought but when he was entered in the Warwick race the classic chase he got a one five nine and Ted Walsh was up in arms about that um but I I could see him provided if his UK mark was to drop a little bit but even if they were to go up to go for Fairy House and they got a nice crowd, I could definitely see him getting involved in the places at least in one of those Grand Nationals, whether it be Ireland or uh, Aintree. OK, a few points to take away from Punchestown then. Um, Barry, we shouldn't forget to mention of the other results at Ascot, uh, what a terrific day Ben Pauling and Ben Jones had. Uh, just absolutely brilliant. Three winners and a very close second as well. Um, an extraordinary day for them. I know you're very close, obviously, with Ben Pauling. Uh, probably the headline act was Henry's friend winning the Reynolds Town. But uh, just an excellent day for a yard. We're having This must be a stellar season for them is it yeah definitely he's a 56 winners this season since he's moved into the new yard he's got amazing facilities now um just outside cheltenham beautiful place beautiful gallops um but also getting into a better quality horse too um but this yeah. is good performance one of three good performances on the day um and ben jones too right under the skin really good lad so now two two bends going places absolutely it was great to see them have uh, such a good day and sort of get the recognition they deserve for such a good season thus far long may it continue of course um, Tony we a little look at Gorham Park saw St Sam win the Red Mills chase that day um, among a couple of other nice performances on the card but I know you weren't that impressed with the aforementioned prize money situation no, it'll be a brief look at the races themselves. Look, St. Sam came back off a bit of a break, uh, won well, is developing into you know a handy little pot hunter there, a bit like easy game, would probably be a little bit harder on himself than that horse would be, but you know those type of races would all be there from um, the kind of small field, two and a half mile race. Riviera Tell probably running back a little bit quick. 
um, after in the last week where I thought she had quite a hard race. Um, Red Mills Hordle, um, length of lady won it, she's obviously well suited to be going on soft ground, um, but there wasn't much of a race in behind. But uh, the, the prize money here for these races now, they're not getting great fields and it's no surprise given the prize money. Um, I just had looked back at the last 10 years of the Red Mills Hordle for instance, like it was a grade 2, it's a grade 3 at the moment, it was a grade 2 kind of um, up until 2016. But even back in the, the kind of pre-pandemic years, 2019, 2020, it was worth 35 grand to the winner. The last three years, the, the kind of post-pandemic race has only been worth 17,700. Like, Jesus, it's a fair drop now. Like The prize money oh, is kind of yeah. half there completely. It's, it's a hell of a drop. And um, there's actually a lot of these races starting to creep in in Ireland, these grade twos and grade threes that aren't actually worth an awful lot of money. So I had a bit of a look there. So since the start of la the last National Hunt season, 22-23 season, there's been about 435 graded non-handicaps in Britain and Ireland. It's a rough 50-50 split, uh, the, the, the number in Ireland and the number in Britain. But um, Ireland, ha I then went and had a look at the ones that were worth less than €20,000 to the winner. And Ireland had over 70% of them, whereas Britain has under 30. So again, the prize money thing, this is kind of slackened off a little bit in Ireland. It, it was always a, a flag to be waving how great the, great the prize money was. But I just think maybe since COVID, they maybe might need to have a look at some of these races that aren't attracting the great fields. And I would think that prize money is probably an influencing factor because that does seem quite a small amount of money. If you think if you had a grade two, grade three horse that was able to win a race like that, you get your training fees covered for the year. But um, one of those, it might be just actually tied to the wire whether you would or not. Would or not. Yeah, that's, it's very it's interesting figures there. That's a surprising drop-off with that pre-pandemic number versus now. Um, shocking, really. But anyway, uh, Tony, we should also mention Tully Hill, please, who won the listed novice hurdle at Punchestown and has really thrown himself into the supreme market. Of course, this is a market who's had sort of a variety of favourites throughout the course of the season and now Ballyburn is 10 to 11 at the top of the market and Tully Hill is around about a four to one shot uh, but is actually our next price boost for what it's worth price boosted out to five to one again for a limited time only subject to change potentially uh, but at the moment it's price boosted to five to one general four to one shout but of course we've got Mystical Power who's five to one Jericho de Repone who's eight to one both those horses have been up uh, at sort of in and around favouritism for the Supreme Tony so where does this Tully Hill stack up in your opinion? Yeah interesting performance surprising performance I suppose where he started out his season but not surprising maybe where he's coming from in bumper horses quite a bit to say here I suppose that the race itself um, he has his own way of jumping Paul Townen kind of commented on that afterwards but it, it is a little bit better um, than definitely not better than it was at Punchestown initially and a bit better than it was at Nace the last time. Um, he would have the look of a horse that might be better going left-handed. He, he does adjust that way a little bit. I suppose visually it looked as if Paul Townham was left alone up front, but he's done quite a decent time, so maybe it wasn't. he wasn't getting it just as easy uh, as it looked. Um, kind of form lines, though, would be a little bit dubious on these because they were very contrasting. He run race. He beat Jigoro further than... Um, Mystical Power beat him and, and Lombron uh, kind of broadly similar. Um, so yeah, it, it looks a kind of a decent performance. It looks to have a little bit of solidity to it. He's a funny one in terms of profile. It's getting a little bit late in the day for maybe Hurst to be throwing themselves into the grade one picture at Cheltenham. But when I look back, there actually have been, I think in the last 25 years, seven horses won the Supreme that had ran in the previous 30 days. Not so much kind of recently, albeit I think the last one was Lebeke. Um, and Vatur kind of before that, Menorah, Go Native and a few of them, more so maybe in the early part of that period. And I think the Ballymore, Ballymore's usually won by a horse now that is coming off a little bit of break. I think the only one that came off a less than a month's break was uh, in recent times was Simon Sig. So you are having to go back um, a little bit further there. The other thing to think about, I, I, I just was reflecting on this, like that it was interesting that Tully Hill was the horse that they opted to run in the grade one bumper at Punchestown last season rather than Ballyborn though perhaps with Ballyborn they just wanted to give him a bit more time and take a more gradual approach to it. I'd say that, that's a, maybe possibly a little bit of a pointer towards Tully Hill. Um, and I suppose anyone who's sitting with a docket uh, on Ballyborn for the Supreme would rightfully probably be getting a little bit edgy at the moment. Um, 
Tully Hill's only entry at Cheltenham at the moment is is a supreme. So if he's going to Cheltenham, which he almost certainly is, it, it's a supreme. Um, and are, are they really going to want to run Tully Hill, Ballyborn, and Mystical Power all in the one race? Uh, it just it would it would be an on Willie Mullins type thing to do. Um, you would think that one of them w would probably step up and trip. Um, now which one it'll be, I don't know. Maybe you, both of you have an opinion on that. But um, I, just, I just couldn't see all three of them going in the supreme. Um, based on kind of past, uh, you know, kind of records and stuff like that. I, I don't know that they really want to be going to the to the, the Bering Bingham with uh, Eel Atlantic maybe as the first thing. No, I, I would be in your camp. I think this is ripe for a bit of switchy-switchy here with these horses between this and, like you say, the Bering Bingham. And I, I wouldn't like to stake a claim at who is going to be switching, but those three aforementioned Supreme Mullins horses, I, I, I'm with you, Tony. I'd be very surprised yeah, i know they're owned by different people but i'd be surprised if all three of them lined up given how we know uh willie's mind can change right up until the 11th hour of course um and on the willie mullins sort of slight angle anyway uh we should move on to a couple of other points to mention news stories i guess from the week uh barry we'll start with the passing of of course willie's mother maureen mullins uh the matriarch of the mullins dynasty and what a dynasty it is and she passed away at the age of 92 uh a serious innings and a, a real time to celebrate a life well lived, I guess, Barry, because, I mean, I didn't know her personally, but everyone talks of her in such warm and glowing terms. But also, like, she really set a standard, it seems, of how to live a life. You know, that article Patrick wrote that was in the Racing Post, I thought was brilliant, gave real insight into her. And I know, Barry, you knew, you did know her personally. Yeah, and she was a lovely woman. Um, I called out to the house on Friday, and that was the general team was you know to uh, celebrate her life because that was she was that type of person especially. Um, you know she was she was racing to the end. She was in Gorn. She cut the tape for the new Wareham last month in Gorn. Um, that was her last day's racing, but she was still looking to go racing in the last week of her life. So she was a brilliant woman, and the stories that Patrick has put in the paper have been you know out of it's hard to believe like talking about pulling donuts in the car park in Nace and she's sitting up in the passenger seat screaming this is marvellous so she was a brilliant <laughs> woman at that age to be like that um so no but always and, and like personally you'd meet her every week at the races as long as I'm riding she's been there um and always for a with a word and a bit of fun and a bit of chat very knowledgeable woman very sharp but no really really nice and she'd be sadly missed by, by all the Mullinses Absolutely. And in that article, I really took it, took it, took away two things from it, I guess, uh, as a sort of like, yeah, words to live your life by. Anybody can appreciate this. But the section, yeah, where he wrote that, you know, she'd say yes to anything, basically. The answer was always yes. And everything was always marvellous. I thought that was brilliant. And also that she was continually right to the end, interesting and interested which, you know, specifically the latter, uh, you know, it's a rarity these days that people are genuinely interested in things around them. So, but Maureen was just that. And yeah, um, that article is well worth a read if you haven't done already. And Barry, the last thing to note before we go on to the look ahead section is the retirement of Jamie Moore. Just a quick word on him, because of course you would have ridden with him, been in plenty of weighing rooms with him back in when he was a bit younger. Um, and his retirement has obviously been forced upon him. Many of you will know the story by now. He had a bad fall and he hasn't been able to come back from said fall. Um, but I, again, just talk about, I know people come out, Barry, and say nice things about people who have retired, obviously. But with Jamie, the well-wishers have, have felt so genuine for him and just so pleased to see him. I know it's not on his own terms, but get out in almost one piece, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And he's had his fair share of injury in the last couple of years. Um, likewise, his brother Josh was forced to retire too, but in similar circumstances. Um, so I'm sure the, the more family in, in all are probably happy to see Jamie out at this stage. But Jamie's a brilliant writer, but above all, a lovely fella. And that's the reflection you, you saw from the wear and the celebration when everyone came out when he won his champion chase on Sarah de Burley, um, Tingle Creeks. He was, he was a top class writer, but above all, you know, just a really good fella, good fun, you know, you always have real fun with Jamie. You're always good company. Easy going fella. Um, but no, really nice and fella I always a great time for. 
And I'm sure he will do... I'm, I'm looking forward to what he does in the next chapter of his life because he seems like the sort of lad who, whatever he turns his hand to, will be a success. Like pretty much the whole of that family, isn't it? Um, let's do competition winner. Uh, we were giving away a £20 slash euro free bet last week and I can reveal that we have at random selected a competition winner and it is Ian Miller. Ian Miller, 2969. You are our competition winner. Um, we asked you about your best anti-post bet for the Cheltenham Festival in the novice hurdle races and you put Bryce Days Ahead as a steal at that price. Non-runner no bet will be half the odds on the day of the race and I believe at the races digital count has already contacted you Ian so congratulations to you. Right uh, very briefly because we've come to nearly the end of the show Barry just a quick mention for what we have to look forward to at the weekend coming because of course we've got Kempton a couple of grade twos there including the Pendle Novices Chase where we get to see Nickelback off the back of the excellent performance at Sandown from the front is your six to four favourite here um, and some other I was going to say some stars on show stars maybe not quite the word but the sort of weekend racing you expect at this time of year I guess yeah, some nice great tools. The Adonis Hurdle kicks off a um, couple of nice up performers there there's Calif de Burley um one of Paul Nichols was a good winner in Kempton last time. Then uh, the Moors have Peking Opera, who was a workman like a winner in Sandown last time, but he was 105 rated on the flat um, and was only six lengths behind Vauban in a group three back in the autumn. So some smart horses. Nickelback should be hard to beat if the ground stays on the better side uh, with possibly uh, Arc Light, a danger, who's won its last three. Um, but no, some good racing. There's uh, the Dovecot as well. Intense approach has it. An unusual entry in there. John McConnell's he fell in a maiden hurdle and has only started our hurdles. Had one, two bumpers. He's there. And Ben Pauling is fiercely proud, who was two lengths behind uh, Jericho the Rapine in Doncaster last time. He looks like a horse could improve and probably not a vintage renewal of that race. Um, and then there's the Arco Trophy, the handicap chase. Looks as competitive as ever. I thought uh, Tweed Skirt might be the one here. She was a winner there last time at Christmas over course and distance. I don't think she got home in Doncaster last time after making the run in behind Marie's Rock in the Mayor's Hurdle. So she's uh, she's two from three around Kempen as well and seems to have taken well defences. Okay, a couple of selections there. And of course, there's also the Ida chase on up at Newcastle and we'll be looking back at all the action this time next week. But just before we wrap up, lads, tracker time, please. Your tracker horses. Um... Tony, I shall start with you, please. Who is your tracker horse from the week just gone? I'm going to go We Charlie. Uh, it's going to be Tom Givney. He ran in the charity race at Punchestown on <laughs> Sunday. Um, thought he was a, a fairly big eye catcher in this race. He was kind of buried out the back, basically last, but made a kind of massive move uh, kind of from six furlongs out to hit the front. On the home tour, no, 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 no. <laughs> being held up in a in a charity race is like being held up in an Irish maiden hurdle. There's a lot of ground to make up, so he, he did kind of it was it was just a massive kind of move. I thought he should have died to death uh, off the back of how much ground he he'd made up, but he actually kept on well near side to finish toward. Um, the winner of that was the Goffer. He's a kind of one four four chase. The runner up is a one twenty eight hurdle. This horse is a. Uh, 104 chaser and a 102 hurdler and I actually thought his run before that at Navan when he ran over I think two and a half behind poor Pavor he looked not to get home that day so I think back at two miles um, he showed fair bit of speed here I, I think he can win one of those low grade races over the minimum distance Lovely. Low grade over the minimum distance. Exactly what the tracker se selection is for um, Barry, your tracker horse please yeah, Todd Arctic Brazil stepped up nicely on his previous start uh, in Goran over fences. He didn't jump brilliantly in Goran, seemed to jump a lot better behind Mr. Policeman in Punchestown and ran a good race. He was a good maiden winner last season uh, when beating Mercury in uh, Cork. I was disappointing in the Talworth when brought the sand down on very soft ground after that. Um, he has struggled to recapture that form, that maiden hurdle form, but this looked to step back in the right direction. Um, and he could be a interesting when he steps into handicap over two and a half plus. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you very much, boys. 
for your contributions as always of course uh listeners viewers mainly out there do get involved in the comments box below whether you're getting stuck into the competition which of course we're giving away a free bet all you have to get involved with was who do you fancy at this stage for the gold cup hopefully our discussion has fleshed out your thoughts a little bit more but in the meantime everyone uh do also get involved with the price boost you know, three price boosts for you but they are for a limited time only and they could change they are subject to change and you must also read the t's and c's and do it responsibly there is all the housekeeping for you it is a goodbye from me that was off the fence